Yarstan's seventh letter. Dear Sophia, Your letter was marvelous. Yasna and Zednik were both here yesterday sharing it with us, celebrating the events that have started unfolding around you. For once we received your letter in the spirit in which you wrote it. I was relieved that you hadn't received my previous letter before you set out on your adventure in the commune and the council. The depressed mood in which I wrote it wouldn't have contributed anything positive to your exciting experiences. I regret much of what I said in that letter. I now have an opposite admission to make to you. I was very moved when you said you were waiting for me to walk into your council office. If such an expedition should ever be undertaken, I'll be the first to volunteer, and of course I'll bring Yara and Myrna along, as well as Yasna and Zednik. I love you too, Sophia. We all do. You've seduced us with your honesty, and especially with your modest, almost shy courage. The circumstances in which your letter arrived were poles apart from those I described in my previous letter. When I came home from the plant the day before yesterday, Thursday afternoon, Myrna threw her arms around me and started to dance around the living room with me. She waved your letter in the air. You're glad to hear from Sophia, I asked. Yara shouted, she's on strike. We're all on strike. We're going to have a party tonight and another tomorrow night. It was my turn to squeeze Myrna and spin her around the room. You're on strike and we're having more dancing parties? Myrna poked me in the stomach. Eating parties, for your sake. There will be a dance at my plant in a week. Want to come? Not if you drag me there. Take Zednik. He likes to dance. I'm going too, Yara shouted. We understand your excitement and your hopes, Sophia. There's good news from everywhere, all at once. I don't think you're, you're being naive or ob obsessively optimistic. Our hopes couldn't ever have a more solid basis than they have now. The world has to change now. If it doesn't, we'll all die as exiles in an inhuman world. Yara and Myrna prepared an enormous banquet, just for the three of us, to celebrate the strike at Myrna's plant. Myrna was drunk before she started drinking. What did your strike accomplish, Yarostan? We ousted a union functionary who did police work. Is that all? What are you waiting for in that plant? We're all waiting for you, Myrna. We need the devil's inspiration. That's exactly what it is, the devil's work. And why not? If we're going to suffer for sipping from the devil's cup, we might as well empty the whole barrel. No more sipping. What did Zednik's co strike accomplish? All the functionaries were ousted, elected workers replaced them at all posts. What did you devils accomplish? Everything, all at once, unanimously. The slowest to come around, the more thoroughgoing. We threw the entire administration, union and police crews, out on the street, and we didn't replace them with anyone. We voted to go on permanent vacation with pay. But where will the pay come from, Myrna? Is that your frere? We'll worry about that when it runs out. We're off until Monday in any case. Then we'll meet again. Someone suggested we use the hated workshop to do all the things we ever daydreamed of doing there. Everyone loved the idea. To begin, we'll push all the machinery against the walls to prepare for our dance. We'll invite all our friends. Then it'll be our turn to wait and see. Tomorrow we'll party all day long, Yara announced. We'll go get Zednik out of his plant, and you go and bring Yasna. Yesterday morning I set out for Yasna's house at the same hour when I usually go to the carton plant. I feel like Tina must have felt when she went to tell you and Sabina about the commune. Yasna, fresh out of bed, is alarmed. She, think she thinks something awful happened. During the week and a half that preceded our newfound joy, we all went through hell. Good news this time, Yasna. The best. Myrna, Sophia, Sabina, everyone is on strike. You're joking. Tell me about it. We rush to my house as soon as Yasna is dressed. Yara and Myrna have already returned with Zednik. Yasna plunges into your letter. Zednik pumps Myrna for every detail about her strike. While reading, Yasna explains, We're finally together again. We're in the one and the same world. Only geography separates us now. Sophia's experiences are identical to ours. I'm so excited. I heard everything you said, Myrna. You're wonderful. I wish school were still on so that I could go on strike too. I leave with Yara to buy groceries and drinks, but the two of us couldn't carry enough to satisfy the appetites of five happy people. When we return, Zednik is reading your letter and commenting on nearly every passage. The rest of us start to prepare our feast. Your friend talks of unions the same way we do, Zednik observes. Why shouldn't G, I ask? They have the same function there as here. I know that intellectually, but I can't accept it emotionally. Unions over there claim to protect workers' interests, whereas their real role is to sell workers to capitalists. Here, unions have the additional function of supervising, of policing workers. I see a difference. You do, Zednik? You who taught me so much about the repressive function of any and every form of representation? Don't forget I spent half my life fighting for the type of union apparatus they still have over there. Myrna shouts, Do I hear Zednik backing away from everything he was defending? Is it really true that gray hair makes people cautious? Read to the end, and you'll see that Yarostan's Luisa is as gray-haired as you. 
Damn you all. Of course it's conservatism. Those young people are turning against everything I fought hard to build. What you built was rotten. Admit it and help them destroy it, Myrna shouts to him. Until a week ago, Myrna was the most cautious amongst us. Now she was the most rebellious. I had known that she loved her brother. I had never known how much she had learned from him. Zednik persists. They don't even know how repressive unions can be when they become appendages of the state. I object. Maybe you never knew how repressive they were when they were only appendages of capital. After all, you were a part of the bureaucracy then. I know how repressive they were, Yarstan, but I had always thought that people would have to experience the transformation of unions into parts of the state apparatus before they finally saw through them. I was obviously wrong. Let me see what else they see through. Zednik reads on while we continue our cooking. Suddenly he shouts, Now this is too much. It's simply wrong-headed. Capitalists aren't the only ones who use mail. We use it too. A communication is needed precisely at a moment like this. What the postal workers ought to do is throw away all capitalist mail and deliver only workers' letters. But a postal strike? That's like blinding yourself. Myrna stops what she's doing. I didn't think of that when I read Sophia's letter. If the post were on strike, we would stop hearing from Sophia precisely at the moment when the revolution was at its peak. Yet we wouldn't know whether to expect the beginning of a new world or tanks. Yasna also agrees with Zednik. It would be awful not to hear from her now. Every new letter is full of surprises. Knowing what they're doing makes us want more. It makes us do more. Myrna adds provocatively, It gives us courage. Is that what you mean, Yasna? I think it's ironic that these few months have been the only time in 20 years when I've been able to receive mail freely, whereas this might be the only time when you stop receiving mail. More than geography still separates us. I obviously can't dissuade postal workers from striking, nor talk them into changing the nature of their strike. But I agree with Zednik. A postal strike harms only the ruling order during normal times, since then communication serves mainly to lubricate that order. But in disruptive times like these, unfettered communication serves mainly to further disrupt the ruling order. If we're going to learn about each other, then let's learn everything, Myrna shouts. Let's fill ourselves with each other, with Sophia and Sabina and their commune. First of all, let's fill ourselves with food and beer. Let there be something for the tanks to invade, right, Zednik? Hey, Zednik, how close are you to done? I've just come to pack classic. Leave me alone. Yara, pointing to me, asked Yasna, was he really like that brainy Pat Klesik when Sophia knew him? Then Myrna asked Yasna, do you suppose Louisa seduced Yaristan in order to humiliate him? Zednik, we're starting without you. Yasna giggles, you're more brainy than Yaristan ever was, Yara. Yasna blushes as she tells Myrna, if I had thought Louisa only wanted to humiliate Yaristan. What would you have done, Yasna? Scratch her eyes out, Myrna taunts. If we're telling everything, you might as well know I would have wanted to, Yasna answers. Myrna shouts mockingly, Shame, Yasna. You are a grown woman, and Yarstan was just a boy. I know. I was as worried about that as Sophia is, Yasna sighs, as if she were dreaming. How about you, Zednik, Myrna asks. Could you love a woman half your age? Why not, Zednik says absentmindedly, trying to concentrate on the end of your letter. Your daughter, for instance, Myrna asks. Zednik coughs uneasily. Let me finish this letter. You're out of your mind. Yasna, still in her dream, seems oblivious to the conversation. Louisa was five years older than I, yet she looked just like a girl when she was with Yarostan, just like Sophia described her when she skipped around that pond. She was always so pretty and so young. I doubt that she has a single gray hair even now. She had everything and everyone. She had Titus as well as that mysterious engineer she came with. I felt so sorry for Tissy when I read Sophia's previous letter. What's wrong with me, she asked. That's what I asked myself every day of my life. What's wrong with me? I was younger than Louisa, but I felt a hundred times older. She and Yarostan were so beautiful together, and even that wasn't enough for her. As soon as Mark Glavney came, she ran after him as well. Mark was the brainy one in that lot. He must have been a city planning commissioner already in his diapers. He's the one Pat Klesik reminds me of, my former boss. I'd like to think Louisa went after him just to humiliate him. She should see him now. Yara leaves her seat, goes up to Yasna, and strokes her hair, whispering, You know what Slobodan told me a few days ago? After our dancing party, he stopped loving Julia and me. He only loves one person now, and she's the best dancer in the world. Well, go get Slobodan, Mara shouts to Yara. Tell him I've forgotten about the radio he turned on. Please don't embarrass me, Yasna begs. If you're embarrassed, Yasna, how do you think I feel? I ask her. I don't know whether to apologize or to cry. Zednik joins us at the table announcing, This is no time to cry. An excellent letter. Let's drink to it. Those people have somehow learned everything we've had to have hammered into our heads by 20 years of total repression. Fill up again. To the commune. What's this about a letter Sophia's hermit tried to deliver to you? Yasna says, That's what I find so admirable about Sophia. 
She loved Yaroslan to the point of trying to find him eight years after she was separated from him, to the point of sending us all letters describing her love for him and getting us all arrested in the process, including the messenger she sent with them. How admirable, Myrna says sarcastically. She had the courage to get everyone except herself sent to jail. Wait a minute, Zednik shouts. Do you mean to tell me you were all arrested because of that letter she sent you? The poor girl didn't know what she was doing. She was only looking for Yaroslan, Yasna tells Zednik. What she didn't know was that her stepfather, or or whatever he was to her, was a foreign spy in the police records. It all makes sense to me now. When I was arrested together with Vera and Adrian, the police kept asking me if I'd known Sophia Alberts. I'd kept insisting that wasn't her last name. I had forgotten her stepfather's name. I don't think I even knew his name. But to the police, Louisa was Albert's wife, and both Sabina as well as Sophia were his daughters. And since we had known all three of them, we were obviously spies. But you didn't even get the letter, I point out. That part I can't understand, Zednik says. It wouldn't be the first time this police incarcerated people because of crimes they had not yet committed. Crimes which the police themselves expected those people to commit in the future. But the whole thing is so ludicrous. It is ludicrous, and I'm still not clear about the role Sophia's letter actually played, I tell Zednik. Jan and I were agitating in favor of the Magarna uprising. Titus had just signed a strongly worded protest in favor of the Magarna workers. We would have been arrested whether or not that messenger had come with Sophia's letters. The letters must have been a mere pretext, a so-called provocation to justify the arrests. What about the rest of us, Yasna ex objects? Vera, Adrian, and I weren't agitating about anything at all. Vera was busy running after her professor, Kren, Adrian was about to finish college, and I'd just gotten my first teaching job. Mark had just become head of the party organization at the Carton plant, and he certainly didn't sign any protest or engage in any ag agitation. And Claude already worked for the police. There could have been no earthly reason for his arrest. I'm convinced the letter Sophia sent to us let, led us to our arrests. The police linked those letters to the so-called spy ring, and they couldn't have made that connection. They couldn't have connected Sophia to Alberts unless someone who had known Sophia had told them. Namely one of us, I ask. Lem mentioned an official, Yasna continues. Only three of the people Sophia wrote to were officials of any type at the time she sent those letters. Claude Tamnich, Titus Zabram, and Mark Glavney. Claude hated the whole bunch of us, especially you and Louisa, and he'd have liked nothing better than to slap us all in jail. But I saw Claude a few days after my release. He was totally baffled by the whole thing, and even accused me of causing his arrest. He's too dumb to have performed such an act, and there was no earthly reason for him to perform it for my benefit. So Claude is out. Titus was also an official, although a minor one, a union official. He also knew all about Alberts and Sophia, but he spent a whole year in jail, whereas half of us were only in jail for a few days. Titus wasn't arrested until more than a year later, Myrna points out. Typical police bungling, I suggest. Either that, Yasna continues, or they wanted to make it impossible to prove that they had arrested eight people merely because a letter had been addressed to them. Titus is absolutely out of the question. He'd have been overjoyed to hear from Louisa's daughter, and he had no reason in the world to have us all arrested. That only leaves Mark Glavney, my former boss. But he's on the state planning commission, Yar objects. Is that the Glavney you're talking about? Zednik asks, amazed that such a high official was once a part of our modest circle. Yes, the one who's going to engage in a major policy debate over the radio, Yasna ex exclaims triumphantly. Member of the Central Committee of the State Planning Commission. Member of the Foreign Trade Commission. Formerly general manager of the carton plant and my boss, M. Glavney. He didn't hate us, though way Claude did, but he certainly loved his career more than he liked us. Lem must have reached the carton plant. The police sent him there. Glavney was the only name they recognized. It was the most important name on any of the letters. Mark was already then a member of the trade union council and head of the plant's party organization. But Lem reached only a secretary, probably a kind-hearted soul left over from the old days, someone who obviously recognized all our names, since he gave Lem your and Jan's address. As soon as Mark returned and read the letter, he saw his whole career falling to pieces. He probably thought any one of us, and certainly Claude, would immediately report the letter to the police, and I'm sure that's exactly what Claude would have done. I'm certain we would have been arrested anyway. So to prevent anyone else from calling them first, Mark called the police and told them he'd received a letter from the famous Albert spy ring. But you've told us Mark was arrested too, I remind her. Shows how stupid the police are. They responded to his call by sending two agents for him in the middle of the night and slapping him in jail. But they released him right away, and the regional party secretary even apologized to him. He wasn't only reinstated in all his posts, but he was even promoted right away. I wouldn't be surprised if he owed his promotion to the fact that he collaborated with the bank director, Professor Kren, in clearing Vera of the espionage charges by accusing Adrian, and probably you and Jan, as well as of having slandered her and Dr. Glavney. I'm convinced myself it was because of him that you and Adrian served such long prison terms and that Jan never came out again. 
While you, Jan, and Titus were dreaming of a different world, Mark was dreaming of his coming promotion in this one. That pig, Yara shouts. I'll tell Julia and Slobodan about that Commissioner Glavny. We'll fix him. What in the world will you do to him? Myrna asks her. You'll see. Yasna tells Yara, that'll happen before you were even born. Don't you want revenge? Yara asks. What on earth for? Yasna asks. What can one do with revenge? Myrna exclaims, Yara is perfectly right. But Mark only did the devil's bidding, I remind Myrna. He did the devil's dirty work, and that's something altogether different. Zednik re-enters the conversation. The thing I don't understand is what kind of letter this was. The charge of espionage was obviously a pretext, since most of you didn't even get the letter. Why did the police arrest nine people because of a letter? Myrna answers, but that's obvious, isn't it? To stop what we're doing right now, that's why. Letters are like the first whispers of a strike. The whispers grow louder. More and more people start whispering. Eventually, they're all shouting. Something none of us had thought of spreads like a disease. The police are the sanitation department. They try to stop the disease from spreading, and to do that, they have to lock up people and kill them, because that's what's spreading, is life itself, and life can't be policed. Yasna adds, Don't you see, Zednik, that, that the period during the Magarna Rising was similar to the present? All news was good news, and every bit of it inspired people to go a step further, gave them courage. The police are too stupid to know that, Zednik claims. I disagree. In fact, for once I agree with Myrna about the likelihood that your letter played a role in our arrest. Maybe they do know that, Zednik. They must. How else can you explain the total censorship they try to establish? Maybe they believe in the possibility of communication and solidarity more than we do. For that very reason, I think it's wrong to blame any of the individuals trapped in the net created by the police. Whether Sophia or Lem or Mark. The fault lies solely with the police. If Comrade Glavny's career can be spoiled by a letter, there's something wrong with the system in which he's seeking his career. I knew the system was rotten, but I didn't know people were arrested for receiving mail not approved by the police, Zednik says. You'd have known if you'd gotten any, Yasna tells him. It all sounds very clear and logical, Myrna says, but none of you have explained anything. First of all, there's that poor messenger. After he spent two years in prison and was tortured besides, Sophia called him a liar and accused him of losing her letters certainly had more of his share of the consequences of that letter. When she finally believed him years later, she left him bathing in filth. Meanwhile, Galapni sits on top of the world, and Sophia isn't doing too bad either. She'd spoiled nine people's lives, yet she wasn't anywhere near the arrests. She didn't even know about them for more than a decade. I interrupt. But Myrna, the very same censorship prevented her from learning about those arrests. You're working yourself up again. Sophia wasn't here. She did exactly the same thing when she was here, and she knows it. She even brings it up in this letter. Sophia asks Louisa why they left all their comrades in jail, and Louisa asks Sophia why. Sophia knows that wasn't right. Louisa acts as if it were the most natural thing in the world. And maybe it is. But you and Yasna seem convinced there was something special about Louisa and Sophia. You seem convinced they wouldn't have run and left the suffering to their comrades. Yasna says, you're putting it very strongly, Myrna, but I admit that I was shocked when I learned only a few weeks ago that Louisa and the two girls had emigrated after two days in jail. You're right. I hadn't thought any of them capable of that. I don't understand it. All of us except Claude always accepted every suggestion Louisa made. We would have followed her to prison if she had been the only one arrested. Apparently someone had something like that in mind, I remind Yasna. Someone was ready to arrest Louisa alone and didn't expect the rest of us to follow her to prison. I think that someone was Claude, who must have been a police agent already then. He thought he could turn the rest of us against Louisa by telling us Alberts was a spy and Louisa his accomplice. That would have isolated Louisa while the rest of us followed Claude like sheep. But his scheme backfired. Do you remember? Four or five days before our arrest, instead of turning against Louisa, all of us lined up alongside her exactly as we'd done in play a year or two earlier, and once again it was Claude who was isolated. Louisa told us politicians of Claude's ilk were using the strike as a base from which to install themselves in the government, and every one of us understood. When she told us the struggle wasn't on one front, but on two, and the greater enemy threatened us from behind, we knew exactly what she was talking about. Unfortunately, the only thing we were able to do about the greater enemy was to carry signs about him, and that obviously wasn't enough. Jan knew that wasn't enough. Apparently, Titus also knew. Three days before the arrest, he told Sophia and me to be realistic, not to expect the working class to carry through its final victory in a day. I understood him to mean we shouldn't be surprised if Louisa was arrested. Apparently, Titus foresaw the danger, but thought it would only be a danger for Louisa. I tried to warn Louisa, but she was perpetually out with Mark. When I told Sophia, she said I was being a defeatist on the eve of the final victory. It's funny, Yarostan, but I remember a somewhat different sequence, Yasna tells me. 
First of all, the rumor that Louisa worked with a spy, I heard that too, but from Vera. From Vera? But that's impossible. Vera was something like Louisa's disciple. She worshipped Louisa as much as I did. Every one of her ideas came from Louisa. I distinctly remember that Vera was the first one to applaud when Louisa said the greater enemy was behind us. She stood alongside Louisa and remained alongside her to the very end. Vera was always very good at creating appearances. She still is. You didn't really know her, she tells me. Yes, she was Louisa's disciple, but she was too vain to remain a disciple very long. I knew she'd wanted her apprenticeship to end long before the strike was broke out. She hated Louisa for being the center of attention. She saw her chance when the rumor about Louisa started spreading. With Louisa gone, Vera thought she'd become the center of attention. She'd become the popular heroine of the revolution, and we'd all line up alongside her as we had lined up alongside Louisa. I obviously didn't believe the rumor, and Jan slapped Vera's face when she told him Louisa had something to do with the spy. But that wasn't what put an end to Vera's attempt to get rid of Louisa. I knew she liked Sabina a great deal. I think she must have become afraid that if Louisa and Sabina's father disappeared as spies, Sabina would disappear as well. I think that was the only reason she lined up alongside Louisa and remained alongside her until the arrest. Was Vera Claude's accomplice when she spread that rumor? Obviously not, Yarostan. Vera stood exactly where Louisa did, against everything Claude stood for. She only wanted to replace Louisa on that spot. If they arrested us because we stood alongside Louisa, they would have arrested us just as quickly if we had stood alongside Vera. But the fact is that we stood alongside Louisa to the very end, and she had no reason to run out on us the way she did. You and Myrna are right, I admit. Louisa certainly didn't show a similar solidarity with us. I can't get it out of my head that the so-called Albert spying was released after two days, while those accused of being mere accomplices were left in prison. Something remains strange about your sudden release, about the whole affair, but I can't focus on it clearly enough to formulate a coherent question. But if, it, but if everything is more obscure to me than it was before your letter came, everything is now perfectly clear to Myrna. They're not the angels you both thought they were, that's all. They ran out on you. How carefully did you both read Sophia's letter? Sabina told us that Albert's person ran out on Margarita's comrades, and your Louisa ran out with him while her husband died at the front. Yara says proudly, I would have died like Margarita if I'd been there. Shooting from the barricades. Just think, she was only three years older than I am when she gave birth to Sabina. Sophia's letters are full of good ideas, aren't they? Myrna asked sarcastically. You deserve Yara's comment, Yasna snaps. Would you like Louisa better if she had died on the barricades? Besides, Sabina left a small detail out of her story. Titus told me something about those events, and so did Louisa, and I remember both of them telling me their army was defeated militarily by the fascist army, and that they had no choice but to run. Sabina doesn't contradict that, I point out. What she says is something I had almost figured out on my own over a 15-year period. She says both armies had their guns turned against the people. Louisa, together with the rest of her union and its influential militants, literally abandoned themselves to an army that was as fascist as the army they fought against. Its aim, like the others, was to tame or kill workers. Only her army was less experienced than the other. That's why they had to flee. A deposed ruler has no other choice. Zednik asks, Is Louisa the same Union militant you had described to me in prison? Exactly the same, I tell him. But you've turned around completely, Yarostan. At that time, you swore by her. You convinced me those events proved a real workers' union could exist, since such a union had carried the, through the greatest working-class victory in history. I believed every word I told you for many years after I met you, Zednik. Toward the end of my first term, I met someone who told me almost exactly what Sabina recently told Sophia. His name was Manuel. I listened to him. I was fascinated by everything he said, but I didn't connect any of it to Louisa. I tell Zednik and Yasna the things I've already told you about Manuel. I also tell them stories that came back to me when I read what Sabina told you. Manuel and Alberts must indeed have known each other, or at least viewed the same battlefield from different vantage points, as, he, as Sabina suggests. The similarities in their stories are striking. Even many of the details are the same. The main difference is in the personalities and standpoints of the viewers. On the day of the Rising, Manuel, like Margarita, fought on the barricades. Two or three days later, and not months later like Alberts, he joined a militia unit which set out to defeat a section of the fascist army. They reached the front at a village, surely the same village Alberts described as Sabina. On arrival, they found that the villagers themselves had already risen against the attacking fascist army and had succeeded in preventing that army from entering the village. This apparently took place several months before Alberts and his army reached the village. Manuel, when Manuel's militia unit arrived, the villagers were resentful and even hostile, although that unit consisted of workers and peasants like themselves. 
The villagers told Manuel's comrades to liberate their own regions and keep the enemy busy on several fronts instead of, quote, liberating their already liberated village. Manuel and several of his comrades were ready to take the villagers' advice. But someone spread the rumor that the enemy unit, still camped outside the village, was soon to be massively reinforced, and the majority of Manuel's unit voted to remain in the village. The rumor was false. The only enemy re reinforcements that arrived were poorly guarded shipments of ammunition. Almost all of these were stolen by Manuel's militia unit, and the ammunition was distributed amongst the villagers. The militia unit remained in that village, but not as a military formation. They fraternized with the villagers, lived among them, and carried out military exploits jointly with them. Alberts told Sabina that the enemy unit camped outside the village terrorized the villagers. Manuel told me the opposite. The enemy unit was totally immobilized outside that village. Its supply lines were constantly intercepted. Entire cargoes of ammunition were stolen. Its very existence was a drain on the entire fascist army. Its only alternatives were to continue to be drained or to retreat. Meanwhile, the villagers appropriated lands abandoned by their landowners, turned the church into a theater and dance hall, established an experimental school, and, it, it, and began to explore new ways of relating to each other and to their surroundings. The villagers weren't terrorized from the front, but from the rear. Some months later, after they had neutralized the enemy unit, a, quote, militia commander and several other, quote, people's officers arrived in the village. They came as representatives of the, quote, working class. They showed papers according to which they had been empowered by the union, Luisa's genuine workers' union. The villagers merely laughed at the representatives. Ne neither the villagers nor Manuel's militia comrades had learned the latest news. The most influential union militants had accepted posts in the government. The commander and his officers confronted Manuel and his comrades, quote, in the name of your own comrades. The commander insisted that the militia union immediately separate itself from the villagers and house itself in military barracks. The entire unit refused. One of Manuel's comrades said the commander was on the wrong side of the battle line. He belonged with the fascist unit camped outside the village. The commander ordered the man to be arrested, but none of the militia moved in response to the order. The commander then drew his gun on the man and shot him. Immediately, Manuel and several of his comrades aimed their rifles at the, quote, commander, whose hysterical shouts of, I command, were of no avail. One of the rifles killed the commander. The officers were told, at the point of rifles, to leave the village immediately. But Manuel's comrades, as well as the villagers, were uneasy. They knew something was happening in the rear, behind their backs, something which represented a far greater threat to their victory than the miserably equipped enemy unit in the front. A few weeks after the death of the militia fighter and the commander, news reached the village that a, quote, popular brigade was on its way to, quote, liberate the village from the fascist menace. Everyone in the village understood what this meant. The militia unit held a crisis meeting. But less than half the men decided to remain in the village, out of a misguided sense of loyalty quote, to, quote, their union. The majority, including Manuel, decided to return to the city where, they felt, the real front was located. Manuel reached the city and remained there long enough to, re to learn that all the formerly unpaid secretaries of the union's locals had become paid functionaries of the government. Former organizers had become work supervisors. The central function of the entire apparatus was to make workers produce the greatest possible amount of armaments for the, quote, popular army. Half a day after his arrival in the city, he was arrested. Ironically, he was not arrested because of his activities at the front. His militia unit's reputation had not yet reached the police. He was arrested for having been a member of a small political sect, which was blacklisted by the dominant political group in the ruling coalition. In prison, Manuel met one of the former militia comrades who had remained in the village and waited for the arrival of the popular brigade. Manuel learned that eight of those who remained were murdered the day the popular brigade arrived in the village. They were charged with being infiltrators. The official story told about them was that they had defected behind enemy lines. Immediately after this massacre, the villagers attacked the, quote, popular brigade and forced it to camp on the opposite side of the village from the enemy unit. Meanwhile, the enemy received some reinforcements and a shipment of arms which was not intercepted, and the enemy unit moved in and through the village, massacring the inhabitants and routing the, quote, popular brigade. Many of the remaining militia were killed in that encounter. The popular brigade retreated from the village and continued retreating all the way to their military headquarters on the outskirts of the city, and on arrival, the remaining few militia were arrested and charged with being traitors. The man who narrated these events to Manuel was himself condemned to death. What Manuel told me about the village is almost identical to what Alberts told Sabina, except for some very significant details. The village was not, quote, terrorized by the enemy army. On the contrary, the villagers held off that army for months, and they fell only after the arrival of the popular army. 
they were massacred by the combined fire of both armies. Secondly, the villagers did not support the fascist army in order to defeat the popular army. That's a face-saving rationalization on Alberts's part, perhaps on the part of his whole brigade, which, being a militaristic organization, prides itself for its militaristic ventures. Defeat at the hands of small, poorly armed enemy unit did not reflect well on the brigade's honor. The whole population had to be blamed for its defeat. But this rationalization is a vicious slander against villagers who had bravely defended themselves against one and then the other army, who were slaughtered by, both, by the combined power of two armies, who died with the knowledge that no army can be popular. When I finished narrating Manuel's story, Zednik asks, But where in the world did you get the idea that Luis's union helped those workers carry out a genuine revolution? From Luis's illusions. I tried very hard to believe them, all of them. But the facts have been creeping into my consciousness for 20 years, destroying those illusions. Luisa seems to believe still today everything she told me over 20 years ago. So much for my single example of a genuine workers' union, Zednik sighs. If all the instruments are rotten, what are we left with? We're left with ourselves and each other, I suggest. Yasna asks, is that bad? Of course it's bad, Zednik says. In my head, I know you're both right, but my heart can't accept that. My heart wants a tool, an instrument. My instrument was the union. To me, the union was like a train. We spent years building the bed, the ties, the rails, the locomotive, and the cars. When the train was all built, we set it in motion, and once it began to move, it continued moving until it reached its final destination. Without such an instrument, we feel naked, disarmed, alone. I suppose this means I don't really trust my fellow human beings. In that respect, I differ from Margarita. I would never be the first person at the barricades. I'd always be afraid I'd find myself alone. If there were no Margaritas in the world, if all those I had to count on were like me, there would never be any revolutions. We would all be forever waiting for someone else. Yara shouts, You're just old! Most of my friends would want to be like Margarita. Yasna, Zednik, and I laugh at Yara's comment, but Myrna takes all three of us to task. Why are you laughing? Out of that whole crew, Margarita and her father are the only ones who deserve admiration. Not only Yara's, but ours as well. All the others stayed with their comrades until only danger came. And then they all got on that train you're talking about and rode away from danger as fast as the train would take them. Margarita was there at the start, and she remained until the end. Zednik responds angrily, You wouldn't like Margarita as well if she were alive, would you, Myrna? I've noticed something a little morbid about you. I think you have a strange fascination with suffering and death. We all admire Margarita. Admiring is easy. It takes neither courage nor effort. But none of us admire our own death. Except you, Myrna. To you, an act is worthless if it's not followed by pain and suffering, and it is only truly meaningful if it's followed by death, as if death were the aim of life. It isn't. It's merely life's end. What you admire in Margarita is her courage to die. What I admire in her is courage to live. There's a world of difference between our outlooks. To you, every affirmation of life is a step towards suffering and death. To me, an affirmation of life is not a step. It is itself the goal. My goal is to live not to take steps toward death. You're far too young for your philosophy, Myrna. In every moment of joy, you see only the coming pain. In every moment of life, you see only the coming of death. That's a philosophy for someone on a deathbed, not for a young, beautiful, and vigorous woman. Margarita had the courage to want a different world, not the courage to want death. Your courage may be greater than Margarita's, but it's not a human courage, and there's something repressive about it. If you can't face death, don't live at all. If you dare to live, you'll know you'll die. Is that your view? Only dead have courage. If they're alive, they must be cowards, traitors, runaways. That's why you were so upset when Yara... Zednik, that's me, and Yasna interrupts. You'll make her sick again. Yara adds, don't forget it's her party, and she, she did go on strike. She does have the courage you're talking about. But Myrna is not on the verge of becoming sick again. I'll describe that sickness later. She's fascinated by Zednik's description of her. Keep quiet, both of you. Go ahead, Zednik. What upset me what, when Yara did what? When Yara, as well as Yasna, expressed a desire to live, all you talked about was the devil and the consequences. You couldn't trust either of them to be a margarita, could you? You were afraid they'd leave those consequences to others, namely to you, and they'd run like Louisa and the others who are still alive. So you tried to stop them from living. Are you done? Myrna asks. Good. Let's drink to Zednik. Then she turns to Yara and asks, How do you play your love games? Yara runs to Myrna's lap. By pretending, like you taught me. Have I ever stopped you? Never. Not once. Ever. And I never told Zednik you stopped me. What did you tell him? I told him you beat me. Once. Only once in my whole life. Why did I beat you? Yara starts to cry. I don't know. Why are you crying now? Have I ever made you unhappy? 
Yara tries to smile. I'm not unhappy. It feels good to cry like this. Zednik says apologetically, I may have gone too far, Myrna. Oh, don't back away so quickly, Zednik. That's precisely your point, isn't it? Go too far and then keep right on going. Live and go on reaching for more life. How far are you willing to reach, Zednik? How much life do you want? As much as possible, Myrna, but without getting killed or, it, or maimed, Zednik answers. Then you do expect consequences. You, mis you misunderstood me intentionally, Zednik says angrily. So long as a police or an army exist anywhere in the world, I expect unpleasant consequences. But I don't prune my life down to nothing because they exist. I try to do everything humanly possible, and if it becomes possible for me to help get rid of the army and the police, as Margarita did, then I'll do that too. Once we do that, arrests and imprisonment will no longer be the consequences of our attempts to live. Am I being clear? As clear as the wine in my glass, Myrna says. And if it turned out that what you thought was possible wasn't really possible? It's always a calculated risk, Zednik says. That's a cowardly way to put it, Zednik. If you were on those barricades, getting rid of that police alongside your beloved, or your daughter, or your comrades, and if it turned out that your goal was impossible, and you were overpowered, what would you do, Zednik? Run for your precious life? If possible, Myrna, yes, but you tricked me. Would it be possible for you to run out on your beloved, your daughter, your... No, Myrna, I could no more do that than not stir at all. You win. But Zednik, you're every bit as morbid as I am. Yara shouts, Bravo! You showed him he's not the coward he says he is. Yasna adds, That was well done. Where's the trick, Zednik? The trick is that Myrna concentrates on nothing but the consequences, whereas I concentrate on everything but the consequences. I concentrate on living. Let the police concentrate on arresting me, jailing me, and killing me. Why do we have to destroy our living moments with consequences that may or may not follow? What does living consist of, Zednik? Myrna asks. Are you preparing another trick, Zednik asks? Of love and comradeship, of dancing and eating, of dreaming and building. What kind of answer do you want? Do you like me, Zednik? Myrna asks. Even though I find you morbid? Of course I do. You have a demon's perseverance, you're perceptive, clever. Do you like dancing with me? The single opportunity I've had, yes, I enjoyed it very much. Go to a dance with me, Zednik. Are you crazy, Zednik asks? I like you, Myrna. You're a friend. Yorastan is also my friend, as is Yara. Zednik, Myrna says with mock astonishment. Are you worrying about living or about the consequences? Yasna blushes. Yara and I both burst out laughing. I shout, bravo, Socrates. Have you both gone crazy, Zednik asks? Did you plan this out beforehand? Is this some kind of prank? It's no prank, Zednik, I tell him. Myrna's fellow workers are going to use their former plant as a dance hall, and they're inviting all their friends. I turn down her invitation. Yara turns to Zednik and pleads, If you turn her down, she'll have to go to the dance without any of her friends, and she wanted all her friends to go. Yasna, blushing, asks me, Would you be willing to go if I promised to give you another dancing lesson? It's my turn to blush. I turn down an invitation to a dance, not an invitation to a dancing lesson. I need another such lesson more than I need anything in the world. Then we're all going except you, Grandfather, Yara exclaims. Didn't you say you'd go out to the barricades when all your friends are already there? You and your mother are trappers, Yara. That's right. Everything becomes possible when all my friends are already there. You both win. You win the argument, you win me, and you'll win the world. We should correct that false religious slogan to say, The morbid shall inherit the earth. Yasna objects. I still think you're mean, Zednik, even if you lost the argument. Couldn't you just say, The living? Yara tells Zednik, call us anything you want, only go with us. We like the way you dance. Zednik objects, but you laughed when I danced, Yara. That's why I want to see you dance again. As you can see, we're all well now. Perhaps we're dizzy. We may even be a little crazy. We're starting to heal from a 20-year-long sickness. But just before we started to get well, we had a major relapse. I'm convinced it was our last relapse. The tense and fearful atmosphere I described in my last letter did not vanish right after I sent that letter. Before the atmosphere improved, it got worse, much worse. I doubt if any external force will ever be able to hurt us as much as we hurt ourselves. I sent my previous letter a few days after Myrna voted against a strike at her plant. Yara was on an outing to the mountains. She returned a week ago yesterday. During Yara's absence, Myrna, as well as most people I came in contact with, seemed to have only one thought, the tanks. Toward the end of the week, the workers at the carton plant began to discuss less, quote, morbid subjects again, there haven't been any new broadcasts about take movements. But Myrna remained in the mood she'd been in when she insulted Yasna. Yara returns from her outing late in the afternoon. Myrna and I are both back at work. As soon as Yara comes through the door, she asks, What happened? What did you do to Yasna? How did you, how did you know about that? I ask. 
How was your trip? I stopped at Yasna's on my way home. It was a wonderful trip. We were all glad we went without anyone older than us. We did everything we wanted to do. On the way home, Julia and I tried to figure out some more things about Minister Vera and Commissioner Adrian, and I went to Yasna's house to see if we'd guessed right. She told me a whole bunch of other things Julia and I didn't know. Then I asked Yasna to come home with me, and she started crying. I asked her what was wrong, but all she said was that she was too embarrassed ever to come to our house again. What happened? Myrna answers curtly. I insulted her. That's what happened. How? Yara asks. I called her a coward. What did she do? She praised the devil. Good for her, Yara shouts. Then why did you call her a coward? Because Yasna is the last person in the world, Myrna begins and stops. She sits down and pulls Yara to her lap. Never mind that now. Were the mountains beautiful? What did you do? Lots of things. We took hikes and climbed to several mountaintops. The most fun was when we played love games on a mountaintop, just Julia, Slobodan, and I. How do you pay, play love games on a mountaintop, Yara? Myrna asks with a fascination that's mixed with apprehension. By pretending, Mommy, the way you taught me. Who did you pretend to be? Once I was Vera Krenna, and another time I was you, and once Julia pretended to be the devil. It was beautiful, Mommy. The three of us were alone in the whole wide world. The glassy, distant look comes into Myrna's eyes. Let me tell you a story, Yara. If it's about Vesna, I'd rather not hear it. It's about a time when I played love games on a mountaintop. You never did that. And it's about you, Yara. Then I want to hear it. I climbed to a mountaintop nine months before you were born, Yara. I took everyone I loved, my brother and my father, my husband and my friend, as well as several of their comrades. There were twelve of them. Counting me, we were thirteen. When we reached the top, it was beautiful because, like you and your friends, we were alone in the whole wide world. Up there, we could do whatever we wanted. At the very top, there was a large flat rock, just big enough to hold me. I laid down on it and let the sun beat down on me. I reached downward with my right hand, and six hands fastened themselves to mine. I reached with my left, and another six grabbed mine. With all the strength in my arms, I pulled all twelve of my loved ones to the top of the mountain, and when all twelve were on the rock, they became one, the one I loved most of all. The devil, Yara shouts. Yes, Yara. The devil fathered you on the top of that mountain twelve years ago. That's a beautiful story, Mommy. It isn't over yet, Yara. I played love games with the devil all day long, but towards evening... Clouds hid the sun. A wind started blowing, and the rock got cold. Everything was possible on the mountaintop, only so long as there was sun and no wind. I started shaking with cold and wanted to return back down to where there was shelter and warmth. I pushed the devil away from me with both arms, forced him down off the rock, and when I sat up and looked, I saw that I was pushing all twelve of my loved ones down from the rock, six on each side. The wind blew fiercely, the clouds turned black and thunderous, and it started to pour. The rock where everything had been possible was no longer beautiful. It was bare and cold. It gave no shelter. I jumped off the rock and pushed my twelve loved ones downward. As soon as I had left the rock, it was hit by lightning. I pushed as hard as I could, but the rain and the lightning blinded me. Suddenly I heard four shrieks in front of me. I had pushed four of my loved ones off a precipice. I backed away from that edge in terror and tried to shelter my remaining eight under a tree. But there was no shelter from that storm. Lightning hit the tree and killed four of them before my very eyes. Now there were only four left, my brother, my father, my husband, and my friend. I pulled them away from the burned tree and started pulling them down the mountainside. The paths were all slippery, and rushing rivers blocked our way wherever we went. I was frenzied and lost track of my friend. Suddenly lightning struck near us again. I lost my grip on my brother and my husband, and both slid down into a river that quickly carried them away. I started to run after them, but my father held me back. He told me they were good swimmers, that they would find their way to land. I was all alone with my father in that terrible storm. The two of us descended, slowly and carefully. We stayed close to the banks of the river, into which my brother and my husband had fallen. But lightning struck again, and yet again. We both fell to the ground, and a tree fell across my father's legs, breaking both of them. I kneeled next to him and cried. My love games destroyed everyone I loved. Yara gets off Myrna's lap and says politely, I don't like your story. Myrna pulls Yara back. I'm not through yet, Yara. The story ends with your birth. I could see that my father was in pain, but there was nothing I could do for him. Finally, the storm let up. The lightning stopped and the rushing rivers became small streams. In the black of night, I ran down the mountainside alone, straight to my mother's house. I told her where I'd left my father. She gathered several neighbors, and they all went to help him, but I didn't go with them. I ran to the stream we had been following, ran along it, and finally came across someone I knew. He told me he had seen my husband in the stream, with his head up, swimming vigorously, but he hadn't seen my brother. I ran on down the stream, hesitated, 
and then turned back and ran back to the spot where I'd left my injured father. The clouds were gone, and the moon lighted my way. When I reached the spot, I saw a circle of people standing around it. There was only one courageous person in the circle. I recognized him as my one-time neighbor and my father's friend. He put his hand on my arm and led me through the circle. The others grumbled and moved away from me as if I were a leper or a witch. He told me they weren't bad people, but they were all afraid. And then he told me my father's legs hadn't been badly broken. They could have been cured. He might even have walked again. When the neighbor had reached my father, he had heard my father moaning about his drowned son, his daughter's marriage to a drowned husband, and about his own inability to help his daughter find her brother or her husband. The neighbor said he died of a broken heart. When I reached the center of the circle, I saw my father's lifeless body where I had left him. My mother kneeled next to him across from me. Her face looked blue in the moonlight. She pointed her finger at me. And at you as well, Yara. You were in my stomach then. You and the devil killed him, she told me. I knew she was right. I crawled on all fours out of that circle, crawled away to my house, and at that moment I was able to let you come into the world because I had paid what you cost. I had paid for my love games with the devil on the top of the mountain.